And what's the baby's name? Sterling. Sterling? Yeah. Sterling, Sterling Silver. Silver. Cheyenne Renee Harris has lived behind bars since 2017. So what happened? He was born in the bathtub. So he had some breathing issues at first. But they got gotten a little bit. She was tried and convicted in the horrific death of her baby boy, Sterling. By her actions, Sterling lost his life. Prosecutors described Harris as a mother who intentionally ignored her infant for two weeks, leaving him to die in a diaper infested with maggots. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Harris was silent during the trial. Do you think you got a fair trial? And she showed little emotion at her sentencing. Ms. Harris, you have a right of allocution, meaning the right to tell me anything you want me to know prior to sentence being imposed. Is there anything you want to say? No, Your Honor. Pursuant to statute, you are sentenced to serve the remainder of your natural life in a facility provided by the Iowa Department of Correctional Services. But now, a year after serving in the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women, the 23-year-old inmate is breaking her silence. UK tabloid The Sun posted this video and article. This is going to be fun. It's going to be real fun. Reporting Harris is being bullied in lockup and spent time in solitary. Yeah, they know. Thank you. She said that at the times that they were showing the video was when there were other inmates around, and so she had to put on a tougher exterior so that she wouldn't be picked on. She didn't want, you know, to, to look more vulnerable or be seen as weak. Public defenders Nicole Watt and Aaron Hawbaker represented Harris at trial. Oftentimes, folks in the prison will know why somebody's there before they walk in the door because they have access to news, they have access to relatives and individuals, and there's always a known pecking order in that regard. The defense centered on drugs. The biggest hurdle being just having this jury look at her like a real person rather than a monster. Why on earth, during the week, that Sterling is found dead on that Wednesday. Was she making plans with her mother to take both the children that week? What that shows you, folks, is that it's not evil. It's not hatred. She was ill, because that's delusion. Harris told police her boyfriend, Zachary Cohen, introduced her to methamphetamines. He was also convicted in his son Sterling's murder. So I think she did have a hefty detox while she was in jail, and that's why in her mugshot, she's so tiny. And then by the time of trial, she almost looks like a different person. A different person that Hawbaker says the jury couldn't see past the awfulness of Sterling's death. I think maybe over time that'll take place, that people will get to know who Cheyenne is and know that somebody's worst days doesn't define who they are. Amazing that uh, she's speaking a little bit, but when your whole life is on the line and people are accusing you of intentionally murdering your child, you say nothing? Wow. Let's bring in Julia Janae. Uh, Julia, this was a, you know, a heartbreaking trial, but it was shocking at times that the silence, uh, to me, spoke volumes. I mean, why is it when all these parents get in trouble with their kids, like Lori Valadebel, they just go silent? You know, in this case, our defense attorneys say that they did recommend that she not take the stand because they had those body camera footages that showed that she was emotional when her son was discovered to be dead and that that spoke the volumes. But there was that risk of putting her on the stand and her actually speaking on her own behalf when this trial was happening. Yeah, I. All right. Every criminal defendant that is uh, spending the, whether it's, you know, 25 years or the rest of their life like uh, Cheyenne Harris in, in jail, they're always thinking about the appeal, the issue. Is, is there an appeal going on? Uh, what's the status of that? There is an appeal going on. She is, of course, sentenced to life without parole in prison. She uh, is under the one homicide rule there in Iowa. They don't have the death penalty, so she was automatically, because she was sent, uh, 
being sentenced for first degree murder, it's automatic life in prison without parole. That appeal happened almost immediately after is when she had new attorneys who filed for her appeal and it's still pending. It uh, has been going on since 2019, around February, March, and there have been motions back and forth between the parties, but it has not been heard by the board, but the Court of Appeals has ruled on her paternal rights for her other child, a toddler that she had that was older, that was well-nourished and taken care of in a way that the prosecutor said that's why it showed that she was intentionally negligent with her baby because her toddler looked so much better, but she was denied full parental rights of that child, which sometimes in prison you can continue your parental rights, but hers were fully denied by the Court of Appeals. Yep, I understand. I understand why. I mean, it makes sense to me, but, I, you know, I, it is what it is. You know, you've got a child. Um, obviously, you want to have some connection to him. Most normal people do. Um, now, the other part of your piece, we see video of her behind bars speaking. This is from some BBC doc, right? Uh, what is it? Locked up with the lifers. Do we know why she agreed to be a part of this and, and how all that happened? You know, it's something where they reached out to a lot of women, according to the public defenders who have been corresponding with Cheyenne Harris. They reached out to a lot of the women who are there in the Mitchville Women's Correctional Facility, and they have been working with and talking to a lot of the different people who are there for life. So that included Cheyenne Harris. As to whether or not there was a particular reason why she agreed to it, other than the fact that they had that access to many of the inmates there, she did not let her attorneys know, but she did say that it was very extensive and that there were a lot of things that were not shown in that article, but that will be coming out in the documentary uh, that BBC is doing that involve her. All right. I, I look forward to seeing that. Uh, to me, it, it's fascinating when you get that view of our, our system of justice. Now, you spoke with her attorneys who, again, speaking for the first time uh, uh, to us, about all this, the legal argument that they had that it was child neglect leading to death versus malice murder. How, what were they trying to do at trial? What was, what was their goal there? You know, purely legal argument when they were asking about this case being either given a new trial or to be dismissed, they looked at the way it was charged. She was charged with first degree murder, and that could either be under the statute in Iowa for malice murder or child endangerment resulting in death. And the way that statute reads is if it's child endangerment resulting in death, then you have to show that there was unreasonable force or torture or cruelty. And the defense argued that this was not something that was forceful, it wasn't willful, she wasn't trying to do this to her child. It's just that the drugs and the issues that she was dealing with, perhaps PTSD, that that made her ignore her child, not even realize what was going on and that she had not checked on him for those 14 days that the medical examiner determined. So they say that if it is child endangerment resulting in death, something more like neglect, then she would be eligible for a different sentence. It wouldn't be life in prison without parole, but it would be something around 30 to 35 years. They're not denying the horror of this case and the way that Bur baby Sterling's condition was, but they do deny that she should have been charged in the way that she was. Julia, I know you stay on top of this case and all the other uh, trials that you're covering, but uh, when things happen, please let us know. In the meantime, you did speak with those defense attorneys, so when we come back, folks, we'll see uh, Julie Janae's interview with the defense team, get an inside look at uh, what they're doing during the, the, the trial and their thoughts, strategy, everything else. That's coming up right after the break. It was a horrific case. We're talking about the death of little baby Sterling, Cheyenne Harris, the mother convicted of the murder of that little baby, maggots in the diaper, just disregarded and completely ignored. Well, she was convicted. We didn't hear from her or her attorneys at the time of the trial or after the trial. But now we have. Julie Janae spoke with her defense attorneys and um, got some really interesting insight into the case, the law, and and what we watched uh, when that trial was here on Court TV. Let's take a listen. What stands out the most to you now out of all the cases that you handle as a public defender? What stands out the most to you about that case? Well, they're all bad. <laughs> you 
you know, I have a, a degree in severity, I think, and uh, uh, when you're talking about death, uh, when you're talking about a child, that becomes worse. It was difficult for us to overcome, especially with the jury, the, the manner of death, especially as was testified to by the uh, medical examiner. That probably stands out the most. And now seeing this Sun article that has been released with a video of how she is faring in prison, what was your first reaction to hearing her demeanor in that video? My, my first reaction was I was just sort of saddened by it. I was upset that she was having such a hard time. I think we everybody knew she was going to have a hard time just based on what she was going down for. I mean, obviously you're going to be treated differently when you know that you know there's a, a baby that died. Um, but I just saw a different side of Cheyenne and I'm hoping that she, since she's been down there, she's been able to show people that side. Um, I was just sort of upset with the way that they portrayed her. Um, I know that she was upset about it too. It's just in speaking with her, you would have thought that this must have been like the worst person in the world. But if you just sit with her and you can start to realize that you have more in common with somebody than you might expect. There was a part in the article where the journalist wrote that she said, Cheyenne said, that it depends on the day whether I want to live. And they didn't give more clarity on what that meant, what she was fearing or or that, but what, what was your reaction to hearing that or seeing that in that article? That didn't surprise me so much because I, I know what Cheyenne went through during the trial. I watched her, you know, react to things. And, and I remember at one point during the trial, when I think when they put up Sterling's pictures, that was when it was like, you know, just hit her about the severity of the case. I don't think she had really made it real to her, you know, what had happened. And once she saw those pictures, I think we had to leave the courtroom. And so I can only imagine what it would be like to live with that for the rest of your life. And then in, in dealing with the people in the, in the jail, uh, she did tell me that she's dealt with a lot of haters. Uh, they don't under, they weren't there. They don't understand what she's been through, and, but that she does recognize that she made a mistake and her mistake resulted in something much more severe than others. But I, yeah, I think her mental state is unsurprising. I know the crux of you all's defense was the fact that she was using methamphetamines at the time and very much under the influence of that. How has it been since she has been behind bars? Does she have access to treatment? I can tell you generally, it's from people telling me things over the years, is, is that it's the uh, most uncomfortable detox you can go through because there really isn't a treatment per se to help with that. And so um, it is cold turkey. And uh, that can make the first days of incarceration uh, very difficult. Well, I think actually in, in the prison, though, I don't know, it's probably a different story, but I've heard a lot of things about the Mitchellville prison itself. And I think that there is some ready access probably to drugs differently in a prison setting than in the local jail. So I think she did have a hefty detox while she was in jail. And that's why in her mugshot, she's so tiny. And then by the time of trial, she almost looks like a different person. She was 20 years old when this happened. And it is on appeal right now. I know you all are not involved in her appeals, but can you remind our viewers what some of the legal issues were, Aaron, that you found with the prosecution's case at trial? The struggle I have with that case, and I think it was even evidenced by me in the closing arguments, is related to the felony murder rule. And the felony murder rule, that really gutted any ability we had to have a robust defense related to uh, mental status and drug abuse because uh, all they had to do was prove malice of forethought, which is a general intent and not specific intent, which is the problem that I have with uh, the felony murder rule is that it, it gets rid of that high bar. And now all you have to do is prove that somebody did something really bad that led to somebody's death. And all of a sudden you're the same as somebody that intentionally took somebody's life. And the fight, as I recall, at least one of them was related to child endangerment, uh, the meaning of torture, the idea that it required kind of active physical abuse, as I interpret that statute, as opposed to passive neglect. And if that's the case, then it would fall under the ver a version of child endangerment um, that wouldn't be allowed to bootstrap into felony murder. And I, I believe that was one of the fights uh, that we had um, because it's a specific version of child endangerment in Iowa that can, can be used to prove murder under the felony murder rule. It's not every child endangerment cause of death. What would have been the difference in the sentence if she had been charged with that lesser? 
charge. So 35 really uh, it, it could be 30. And so she could have been 50, low 50s to be paroled. Um, they probably would. It would be a supervised release as you're letting, you know, integrating somebody back into society. That would have been a, a big difference. And I'm 52. So <laughs> I know we didn't really have a chance to interview you all after this trial happened. We did talk to prosecutors. But can you recap for us? What were some of the biggest challenges to overcome? Well, the things I remember was the biggest hurdle being just having this jury look at her like a real person rather than a monster. And even after voir dire, I gave the opening statement and I could feel myself just trembling. I think it's visible on the video of me just shaking because you can just feel the hatred in the eyes of the jury looking at you because they've heard enough about this case. They've probably seen a little bit about it in the news, even if they don't want to say so. And they do not like you. And I've done more than 80 trials. Aside from Cheyenne, I never felt that same sense of terror in having to present an opening statement to a jury. And that just seemed like the biggest part was just trying to make sure that we presented Cheyenne as a human being, not a monster, not somebody who looked like she was like actively trying to kill this baby, because I don't think that was ever her plan. Um, I think ultimately, apparently we failed in that mission, but that was for me the, the biggest part. Aaron, what played into you all's decision. I know it's ultimately Cheyenne's decision, but um, perhaps not a recommendation for her to take the stand in her case. Well, without getting into the specifics of, of the discussions with Cheyenne, you know, it, it's always a, a game time uh, decision. That's, that's how I explain it to my clients, that um, you weigh the relative benefit of having your client take the stand in light of whether or not you already have the evidence in to make your argument. And of course, we were trying to rely upon expert testimony at that point versus uh, an effective cross-examination of your client. And we already had some video when they first went to the house of how she was at the time and that she was crying. So we already had evidence of who she was. And in contrast to the dad, who was particularly stoic when this was happening, she you know, obviously was upset. Um, and, uh, you know, and so in those decisions, you just make a decision on balance what's best. Well, I can't emphasize enough how difficult these facts are. I don't think any defense attorney would want to trade places with you in a case like this. Anything else you want to say about this article or about your client? I was not particularly surprised. Um, it's, it saddens me. It was a difficult case, very difficult pictures to get past. When you step back and you look at it, the whole circumstance is just sad, uh, not just with the loss of Sterling, uh, but to have Cheyenne's uh, life effectively ended at such a young age, because in the time that we spent with her, if there could have been a different resolution short of her losing her life, I do think that she would have taken advantage of that.